So, Secretary of State, um, sorry you can't make it to our conference, but thanks for agree agreeing to do a film conversation with me. So, you'll have 500 um, prov senior provider sector leaders watching this conversation. What would be your kind of three key top line messages to them? Well, the first thing is, I'm sorry I can't be there. Does that count as one? That certainly uh, does. The, uh, I'm, I'm, I have to be in uh, London attending a, an event with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, so I uh, couldn't get out of it, otherwise I'd be with you. So this is a great opportunity. Uh, I'd say the, f the first three things are, um, first of all, uh, how impressed I've been with how providers are dealing with the difficult circumstances that we face. Uh, in the NHS right now. I get it, I understand the pressures, and I've seen them at working level and all the way up to my conversations with uh, Simon Stevens and Ian. So the, there's a, uh, a I, I understand the pressures and we're working on it. The second uh, is that uh, I also see opportunities, and you'll have heard me talking about the opportunities from technology, especially of changing the way uh, the attitude we have to technology to be more agile and open and iterative uh, and we're just about to come out with a new set of standards on how technology should be adopted uh, and um, I I ensuring of course that you as providers can, uh, can build or buy the kit that you need uh, but also that it fits in with the other, uh, the other kit around the system uh, building on a lot of good work, that's the second thing. Uh, the third thing I'd really like to talk about is the workforce. Um, I'd love to see a, uh, a change in the levels of morale in the workforce of the NHS, uh, which could be and should be one of the very best places to work in the world. Uh, and I think too much we rest on our laurels and we use the fact that it's such a mission-driven job that people really love um, not to give people the best management uh, and ultimately leadership that they deserve. Uh, you know, the result of that is relatively high levels of bu bullying. We're seeing increases in difficulties with retention across the piece. Um, and um, I think there's a huge amount of uh, attention that everybody in this room needs to pay to making sure we have the most highly motivated, highly valued, uh, workforce uh, and, and what that takes is leadership. So you've obviously as a new Secretary of State you've, um, you've been going round um, lots of trusts, um, you've had a number of visits, you've been doing some working shifts, what, what, what's your sense of what you think trusts are doing well and what do you think they could do better? Well that's a really good question uh, and um, the, but my first instinctive reaction to it is the variance is so huge uh, that each of them that I've seen are doing some things well and some things less well. Um, and some of them are doing lots of things well and a small number of things that can improve and some the other way around. Um, but the variance is the big thing. So uh, it's not a direct answer to your question because um, I'm, I've been frankly astonished at the different... Uh, 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 the different ways of doing the same thing in very similar settings as opposed to learning, you know, all following best practice um, and, um, uh, 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 and just how it, it, some places you can, you, some, they've got something absolutely sorted and then you see the same sort of process done elsewhere um, that could be massively improved. So uh, that one of the reasons that conferences like this are so valuable is that everybody in this room has got something they can learn uh, from the person they're sitting next to. Everybody can learn from best practice elsewhere. And I think that the increased transparency over the last few years of uh, down to quite a high level of detail um, that allows you to say, well, what, do I, what are we doing well compared to our peers? What are we doing less well compared to our peers? And then turning up at your peers and, uh, and finding out how they do it better. Uh, I think that transparency has got a huge amount of potential still to go. Okay. 
Um, so if you look back over kind of previous secretaries of state, it's kind of interesting in for health and now social care. Um, I, I think they've done the job in different ways. Mm. Uh, you know, you've had some sort of big bruising interventionist reformers. You've had some people who've perhaps been sort of seeing their role as more stand back, strategic and kind of enabled the service to give of their best. So I'm just quite intrigued as to how do you view your role as a secretary of state? Uh, I, I've thought quite a lot about this and talked to the various other system leaders about it. Uh, and my predecessors. Um, I haven't really characterised it before in words, uh, but what I'd say is that I am by instinct an iterative reformer. Uh, I see the role of Secretary of State as to set a direction, uh, fight the battles for the NHS across Whitehall, uh, and to communicate where we're going and, of course, handle crises as and when they uh, occur. Um, the, the, that means providing the direction of travel that the system needs to go in, it's sort of system leadership. Um, uh, and occasionally I'll have to dive into the, you know, deep into the details of one particular area, uh, whether that be um, clinical waste or, um, or, or, the, or the finances of an individual trust. But that's pretty rare. I don't plan to spend every Monday diving into the details of one trust or another. Uh, if I need to dive into the details of a trust, that trust has, is in need of some very serious attention. Um, and I, um, I have brilliant people around me. Uh, you know, Ian's job is to make sure that each trust is on the straight and narrow, uh, and in particular that the trusts that need support uh, get it. Uh, Simon's job is to uh, provide the um, the day-to-day -day leadership of the system as chief executive. So mine is more like an executive chairman's role. You know, the system as a whole, not just the NHS, also the social care system, including, of course, the the, the public health and the um, uh, 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 and, and the health education elements, uh, all it brought together in my office. Uh, in the same way that um, you know, many, many of the interventions we need to make to make the NHS sustainable are not even in control of my department. You know, think about the obesity strategy, which is essentially a cross-government strategy. And there, that, my job there is a lateral one rather than a hierarchical one to knock down doors across Whitehall to make sure we get our way. Um, so uh, I hope that's a reasonable no, characterisation. Um, it's... Um, uh, uh, I, 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 uh, and, and of course I picked the three areas I really want to drive uh, in the first instance. Uh, technology which is my uh, background and I'm absolutely sure we can get some real wins from if we, uh, if, if we learn from how other parts of public sector organisations across the world have done this well and I've articulated some of that and there's plenty more coming. Um, on uh, prevention, getting the overall uh, resources of the uh, of the whole system uh, more towards prevention rather than cure and of course the workforce which I just touched on. Just out of interest if you'd have the chance to add a couple more <laughs> to your three priorities what was sort of next on the list but didn't quite make it? Well the thing about prioritisation is if you prioritise everything you prioritise nothing so let's stick to those three. Eh? Okay yeah sounds good. <laughs> Um, so the NHS is kind of, so let's get into a bit more of the detail, so the NHS is working hard on developing a long-term plan. Yes. It'll obviously be very wide-ranging, but if you were to kind of encapsulate what you think it needed to do and over what time frame, um, what would that be? Well, I'd say that the uh, absolute core of it is how to make sure that as we increase the budget by £20.5 billion pounds over five years, um, that we get the most that we possibly can out of that budget. Um, and that, of course, can't be done just looking at 20 billion uh, as an additional on top. It's about how the whole system gets the most out of its resources. Now, I want to see a big push towards prevention. Uh, and uh, you can only make relative changes in budgets uh, when the whole budget is going up. Uh, but of course, I also recognise that some of that money uh, has to ensure that the provider sector is uh, stable and thriving, uh, coming from a, what is a difficult base. Um, so there is a um, that's the that that the link up between the policy and the finances 
is at the core of it. Um, and within that, getting as much into prevention rather than cure uh, is, the, uh, is, 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 is critical. Okay. So just going back to your kind of um, executive chairman bit, um, what do you think your role as executive chairman is in relation to the plan, in terms of actually the creation of that plan? Well, it's, uh, it's, it, it's being written by the NHS, but it's also a co-creation. Uh, I've set out uh, what I think my priorities are, uh, but I very much am being um, guided by the clinical advice, and, um, uh, and the NHS holds the pen. So, you know, I have a weekly uh, meeting with uh, Simon and Ian, um, what we call the quad, um, with uh, my Chris Wormwell, my firm sec as well, uh, and, um, and, and we talk about the development of the long-term plan in that, um, but it is a long-term plan written by the NHS for the future of the, uh, to guarantee the future of the NHS. Uh, and, um, you know, my, my whole philosophy of, your, of the task as a Secretary of State is to set out a view of where we want to get to and then take advice on how you get there. You know, I'm very open-minded on the route. Uh, and the goal, how I characterize where we want to get to, is we want the NHS to be the best health system in the world. Uh, we want to be focused more on uh, prevention rather than cure. We want to be uh, the best employer in the world, using the best technology um, available, uh, where with all with the goal of longer, healthier lives. Um, that's uh, that's pretty high level, uh, and um, there's a uh, and of course I have a view on the details, but on the details I'm very much uh, I very much listen to the uh, the the advice of management and clinicians within the NHS. Okay, so you've already referred to this interesting balance that the long-term plan's got to strike between effectively uh, transforming the NHS, being ambitious about increased outcomes, but exactly as you put it, um, the provider sector also needs to recover the performance in terms of the access standards and also recover the finances. Um, I mean, clearly the trust sector that we represent is a bit nervous about the fact they're going to be asked to do too many new things and not funded properly to do it, and they won't be given long enough uh, to recover the performance, and mm. that won't be funded properly. So mm. how, how, how are we going to strike the right mm. balance between those different things? Well, the areas I'm most excited about are the areas that can do both. So the, the health is one of the few areas of life that when things get, uh, when there are improvements and improvements in technology, uh, that costs more or is seen to cost more. That ain't necessarily so. It may be the case when a new drug comes on stream and whilst it's in patent, the drugs company, you know, can, uh, uh, can charge an awful lot for it. Um, but with the new generation of technologies coming on stream, we can improve care and improve the lives of people working in the NHS and reduce, not increase costs. So I don't, I don't really recognize a binary tension between transformation and long-term financial sustainability. Sure, there are some things that we could do that will improve lives and cost money and increase pressures, and some of them, I don't rule them out, some of them um, we should do. Um, but the area I'm really excited about driving is the area that improves lives and reduces costs. That's what led me to have put so much focus on the prevention agenda. And it's really interesting that, uh, to me that pushing that agenda has been like pushing in an open door, uh, including those who you might think would be concerned about, um, oh my goodness, does that mean all the money is not going to go to my budget? Um, you know, when the, when, when the, um, when it, when it's surgeons in a hospital telling you that what you need to do is spend more money on GPs to keep people out of his surgery, you know, then you realize that the whole system is crying out for more support for prevention. Um, and, um, a and also you can get um, what, uh, uh, you know, in the technical parlance, um, NPV positive interventions uh, that are that are both transformative for people's lives and public health and, uh, and the health of the public, the health of the nation, and also reduce costs either now or in the future. That's the area that I really care about. 
So um, just tell us a bit more about, um, about um, the, the, the vision of the transformation. And, and as you know, there's a lot of um, emphasis being placed at the moment on integrating and bringing yes. health and care together yes. and using local um, sustainability and transformation partnerships, yes. integrated um, care systems. Um, just tell us a bit about how you think or where that fits in the vision, your vision of transformation. Well, this is more, uh, it isn't just about the uh, integration of health and social care, vital as that is, but it's also about the integration of different parts of the NHS, uh, frankly. So, you know, I am a, I come from a, um, a, a broadly free market background, um, but I've also seen how if you have um, forced competition, uh, where in fact you can get more value out of collaboration, uh, you put in place silos and boundaries uh, that um, mitigate against people working together, and I want to reduce that. Um, I'm, um, I'm excited about the prospect of uh, uh, integrated care provider uh, contracts uh, that the NHS is currently consulted on. And um, I think it's a, uh, everywhere I've been, I've seen the opportunities that people have to told me about from better collaboration. And often this means not necessarily driving your budget uh, hard, uh, but instead having more patient-centric uh, care. Um, and um, we're going to try it in some areas, and uh, some areas are more mature in terms of the relationships on the ground, um, and um, uh, 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 and we'll iterate on it. You know, we'll keep, we'll uh, we'll we'll see how it works, and then and then keep progressing. I mean, I have this attitude to to how you progress, having done this in lots of different parts of um, uh, uh, of government, which is that um, I'm quite sceptical of piloting mm -hmm. because I prefer agile iteration. And if I were to go out and say I'm against piloting, people would throw their hands up and say, oh my goodness, he doesn't want an evidence base. That's not it at all. It's the opposite. It's that I prefer, when I'm launching something, I'd prefer to launch a wave one. Yeah. So you don't have to get to the end of a long project and then have a review, usually by an external consultancy, and then decide whether to continue with it. What you do is you, you try something out, you test it, you take the evidence, you iterate, you change it, and then you try it differently having learnt the lessons, or exactly the same if it's worked perfectly, and then you expand it gradually and organically over time. You know, that is a far better way to learn, because one of the big problems I've been really surprised about on arrival in the NHS is how many things are piloted and how infrequently even successful pilots get taken up, because maybe the budget isn't there anymore or more, or, um, or nobody else heard about it or, or what have you. You know, the promulgation of good ideas um, is is really poor and needs to improve, uh, and part of the reason for that is a, uh, a, a, a fetish about piloting everything, uh, as opposed to learning from successful pilots or from good wave one projects, iterating them, changing them where necessary, and then getting that roll out, roll out, roll out, roll out. So um, I just can't resist um, just following up on terms of the, the um, your scepticism of enforced competition. So if you go back to your predecessor, but to Andrew Lansley, what he put at the heart of the system was this concept of the purchaser provider split, commissioners commissioning providers, and then providers competing with each other. Yeah. And you know the NHS seems to sort of recently be sort of moving away from that and effectively saying it's about actually systems coming together. Um, so uh, what's your yeah. kind of sense about where we are on this purchaser provider competition bit? So. Commissioning is very, very important, and the split between providers and commissioners uh, is important because you need to keep uh, financial um, uh, uh, grip on the system. The question is, at what level do you commission? So the concept of an uh, integrated care provider is that you are commissioning at one level higher at a, uh, uh, over a geography rather than for individual services. I've seen, you know, for instance, in some areas, uh, mental health uh, trusts separately commissioned to a, uh, a hospital trust, separately commissioned, of course, to, um, to the GP arrangements through CCGs, um, and um, finding it so difficult to work with each other because of the, 
uh, because of the, the cash flows. Um, and likewise, um, the uh, consultants passing their cases around the hospital and they get paid on each click of the turnstile. Um, I c so I am I'm instinctively in favour of using commissioning to keep grip on the system and make sure we get value for money. Um, but I think, but I'm sceptical of the um, use of uh, those mechanisms um, where the silos that they require uh, get are a barrier to improving things on the ground. I care about choice for individuals. You know, if you want to move GP practice, you should be able to. If you, if you, if you, within reason, if you want to have a treatment in one hospital rather than another, it, in agreement with your GP as a commissioner then you should, that's true for individuals. But at a system level, whilst it has value, um, the, the purity of a uh, choice and competition framework uh, leads to some significant downsides. And it, you know, this is not a market uh, in a private sense because people don't go out of business. And whilst I'd love to see some new providers coming on board, there's that's pretty rare, yeah. right? So if you take away the fact that uh, th those two facts, um, then you can't just rely on uh, choice and competition. You want to have enough uh, commissioner grip to keep the finances right, and you want choices for individual patients um, through their, with the alongside their medical professionals. Um, but that, but we've got to have make it easier for people to work together across the silos. So, um, in terms of the extra investment that's been made, I mean, the NHS very, very much welcome that, but it also was very nervous about the fact that it only just keeps up with um, cost and demand. So, just what's your perspective on the extra investment? Well, it, it, cost is not an exogenous factor, right? Cost is not a purely external factor. Um, cost can be gripped. Um, and in, uh, uh, both on the supply side, as in everybody in this room, you know, spends an awful lot of part, part of an awful lot of their days gripping costs all the time, uh, and that's very, very important, and and, and it will continue. Uh, I'm determined to ensure that the extra money doesn't um, doesn't get uh, frittered away in the way that lots of people thought it was in the mid 2000s. Um, but I am. Uh, but I'm also very keenly aware that one of the best ways to keep costs down is to reduce demand. And one of the best ways to reduce demand is the prevention strategy. So it brings me back full circle to why do I care about prevention? Why have I put it as one of my top three priorities? And um, why do I want as much money as possible within um, reason of the extra 20 billion to go to that part of the, um, the, uh, the furniture, uh, that part of the system? Uh, the answer is because it's the way to make the rest of the system sustainable, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and 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 so the, it's a it's a it, it, there's a reason I've come to that view, uh, with the very strong advice and support of all the senior leaders of the NHS. So we talked a bit earlier about the fact that um, trusts are under huge amounts of pressure, and you talked about the need to recover performance. Um, um, how do we think that should be done? Oh, well, th there's, a, there's a whole series of things that we need to do. Um, one is it can't be done without more money, uh, both uh, for this winter, uh, the extra uh, money that I announced last week uh, to help uh, with care packages to get flow, uh, and also the, the, um, the capital injection for uh, this winter. So that's in the sort of immediate trying to ensure uh, this winter goes as well as possible. Um, and then over the, uh, over the future. So it can't be done without money, um, but it's also got to be done through reform. Uh, and um, I am all ears for ideas that reduce costs whilst uh, keeping care uh, as good as it is or even better. Um, there, are, uh, there, are, there are endless ideas still out there, even after several years of pressure, uh, and if there are barriers to those being implemented that, um, that we can do anything about in the department, then I want to know about it. So you've mentioned winter. 
um, everybody says secretaries of state <laughs> uh, have an interesting time in their kind of first winter. So you've been preparing for the winter pressures. Kind of how's it going? And have you got any particular messages that you'd want to communicate to the trust sector as we begin to think about preparing for winter? Well, yes. Uh, so well, yes. Uh, I'm a Game of Thrones fan, and um, winter is coming. <laughs> uh, the uh, the we all know that uh, the, um, uh, the 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 there are preparations underway. I have a weekly uh, meeting about winter, uh, and um, I think there's a lot of good work uh, that's going on. Uh, the um, extra money uh, for social care, I hope, will help to uh, get people out of the of hospital when they don't need to be there. Uh, the capital funding, I hope, uh, well, it has to be spent by December, or otherwise it's clawed back. So um, get on with those projects, um, and um, th then. It's a matter of making sure that the, um, the situation is managed as well as it uh, can be through what is going to be a difficult time. I appreciate it's going to be a difficult time and I am grateful in advance to the uh, huge amounts of work that everybody in this room is going to do. Now, I want to take a slightly different approach to the approach that was taken uh, to the balance between uh, electives and um, a, a non-elective care uh, this winter. I want to plan in advance to ensure that there's capacity uh, to for the inevitable spike in uh, uh, I in activity, um, and then if it isn't as bad as last year, uh, if the flu is uh, less uh, less acute, um, then we can bring forward elective rather than uh, putting it off. Uh, and I think Pauline has got a great grip on. Uh, winter, I think she's absolutely brilliant at her job, uh, and I have a huge amount of uh, faith in her uh, planning, day-to-day -day planning of trying to help the system as much as possible. But it's really a team effort. Okay. So trust leaders tell us that the biggest problem they face currently is the workforce shortages. Yes. So interested to know what you think your role is in trying yes. to help solve those problems. Well, firstly, I think there's absolutely the right diagnosis, uh, and uh, it was. Uh, uh, when I, uh, a fortnight ago I was on a night shift and um, we, we asked every nurse station in every, almost every ward in the hospital what they would do if they could do one thing. And every single one, bar one, said um, more nurses. Uh, and the other one said, can you sort out the, t the tech? Um, and um, the, uh, so I get the pressures. Uh, I'm frustrated that um, the um, amount of vacancies that are carried are, of course, covered by people who often um, work in the NHS uh, or were, or certainly are qualified to work in the NHS. I mean, they have to be qualified, of course. Um, and and I uh, I think that the um, I think that the bank system works pretty well, but I've been absolutely shocked by the different levels of use of agency. Um, in some trusts there is no agency at all. I think that's terrific. Uh, and then I see some trusts uh, having to use agency, um, but when the bank is available, which is much better value for money, um, then that is, a, that is difficult to justify. Um, we've also got to remember as leaders of, of people that agency hits morale. Because if you're working at 3 o'clock in the morning on a nurse station and the person next to you is in this hospital for their first time and therefore find it very hard to do as good a job and you've been there for years and they're being paid several times more than you for the same shift and they don't have the responsibilities and can walk out the door uh, if it all gets a bit much, then that is demoralizing. And there has already been downward pressure on agency um, use in the last uh, couple of years, but boy, there's going to be a whole lot more. So one of the biggest things in your intro is social care, mm. uh, and I think there's a bit of frustration kind of growing that the political class has not dealt with this rather prickly but very important nettle. Um, so I just want, again, your perspective about what do you think needs to be done there, and can we be confident that the nettle will be grasped? Um, yes. The, we'll have a green paper before Christmas. Um, of course, in the short term, uh, we have to ensure that the system is funded enough on the existing basis. 
uh, and um, we've shown the commitment to do that. Uh, but in the uh, longer term, we've, of course, we've got to solve this. Now, I think that one of the problems has been that people have tried to solve this problem uh, by solving everything, all the problems in social care. Um, some of the problems are politically contentious. Uh, and what we should be doing is solving the problems that we can solve uh, and, and, and moving things forward. Um, and, uh, but it's clearly a, uh, a big task and there's a lot of work going on right now. So you're, you, we've already talked about technology two or three times. Um, I'm just very interested on your perspective on the trust sector technology in terms yeah. of, you know, we, you've, you've talked quite a lot about um, online GPs. What, yeah. what, where would you be saying to trusts they should be focusing their attention in terms of use of technology? Uh, it, 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 everywhere, but let's start with interoperability. The crucial thing is this has got to be a board level decision. If you leave this to your, um, to your technology team, your IT team, even if you leave it to your CFO, it will fail. Absolutely. This is the use of technology is absolutely at the core of running any large organization, including a, a, an NHS trust. Uh, and it's a board level issue. And you don't need to understand or need to know how to code to be able to manage it effectively. And I think one of the challenges has been that change management from a, in a clinical world tends to be cautious and slow because you want to make sure something is tested to death before, it, 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 uh, say, a drug has to be tested extensively before it's adopted. Whereas the role of technology is to be much more agile and iterative. I think people end up it, it, captured by suppliers uh, because they have try to uh, externalize far too much of their technology instead of having people on the inside with a line up to the board, to the chief executive, who really understand the technology um, and, the, and those people then procuring the right stuff. So we're going to come forward with um, mandatory standards for the interoperability of equipment. Uh, but crucially, it needs to, it, it's all about user need. It's, what is the user need? Your user might be your clinical staff, they might be your management staff, they might be your, uh, your patients. Uh, focus on the user need. Make sure that you understand, uh, you have people who understand the technology and that they have a line up to uh, the boss so that they are, the technology is completely integrated with the business process. Um, so about, I'm told 80% of trusts have um, have um, uh, uh, systems, for instance, for, for e-rostering. Yeah. In fact, hands up in the room. How many's got an e-rostering system? Right. How many use it? Because I'm told that's about 20%. Now, if these figures aren't true, and <laughs> you can tell me afterwards, <laughs> you can report, report back. back. <laughs> um, then, but that's one example. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen some heroically uh, uninteroperable systems uh, and even within a trust, there's no excuse for having systems that don't talk to each other. And in future, there'll be no in excuse for the systems that a trust has not to talk outside. And an, and an iteration on a piece of technology doesn't have to be uh, painful for the users. It has to be designed to benefit the users. And again, come back to the point I made earlier about differences. Across the country, there's some amazing pieces of kit being used that are really simple, all the way through to the incredibly groundbreaking yeah. use of artificial intelligence, for instance. Um, and so, uh, you know, look up and look around and hire the best tech people you can uh, and give them the air cover uh, to go and, uh, and improve and your your, your staff and your patients will thank you for it, and your Secretary of State. So, two, <laughs> two final quick questions. The first is, um, one of the reasons you can't be, well, the reason you can't be with us today um, in person is because of World Mental Health Day. So, um, what's your message on mental health? There's one clear message, which is mental health is as important as physical health, and indeed the two are highly correlated. Part of the long-term plan will be about addressing the, uh, the, the concerns that mental health has not had parity with physical health. And I'd say to the people in this room, that includes the mental well-being of your staff. Some of your staff witness some pretty uh, traumatic things, and sometimes they have personal responsibility for dealing with them, and that doesn't always go right. That is a difficult uh, very personal uh, thing to deal with 
And I don't think across the NHS we're nearly good enough in the support for the mental health of our, uh, of, of our own. Okay. And then final question, which is, um, you spent most of this week um, at Tory party conference discussing Brexit. Um, clearly there is a nervousness in the NHS about the risks from Brexit, the operational risks, the uh, financial risks and the workforce risks. What's your kind of sense about where you think the risks for the NHS lie and, and, and how well prepared do you think we are to meet those risks? Well, at Tory party conference, I spoke as little as possible about Brexit. Uh, I, I prefer talking about the future of the health of the nation. Uh, but of course, there's a, the, there's a link. Uh, we've made some uh, good progress in terms of uh, making sure that we have the, uh, we're going to have the unf unhindered flow of medicines and medical devices. Uh, uh, but there's clearly uh, there's further work that needs to be done. Um, I'll be contacting all trusts soon uh, with more details of where our planning is up to and, um, uh, and what planning we need from you. And I'm very grateful for your engagement in this. Our overall approach is that, uh, of course, I don't want a no-deal Brexit. Uh, I, I doubt anybody in this room does. Uh, but, I, but we need to be prepared for it in case it happens. And uh, some, of some things that we need to prepare for, some preparations have to happen now, even whilst we're still um, optimistic about getting a, a, a deal. So I'll be, I'll be writing out to everybody soon. Uh, so look out for that. And thank you for your support in, uh, in making sure the NHS is going to be ready. Final, any, any final thought, any final message you'd want to give to everybody in the room? Well, the final thing I'd say is a great big thank you to all of you uh, and to everybody who works in your teams. Working in the NHS is a mission-driven job and it is about more than just yourself. It's about being part of a team that's serving the nation and improving the health of the nation. And I never forget that. And I think that we need to make sure that we have the self-confidence, especially amongst management teams in NHS trusts, to say this isn't about the nurses and the doctors alone. The health of the nation is improved by everybody who works in the NHS, from the person who keeps the, the ward clean uh, to the IT worker uh, to, the, uh, 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 to the porter, of course, to the consultant and the nurse, and everybody in management who, who, who keeps the show on the road uh, and, um, uh, uh, and provides leadership and direction to their organisation. Uh, everybody has a part to play, and I'm very grateful to you all.